First Kings chapter 11. I, I want you to really read this carefully. Here's what it says. But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn your hearts after other gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princess, and 300 concubines. That's sad, chicks. <laughs> and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord, as was the heart of his father, David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as his father, David, did. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab. On the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Moli, the abomination of the people of Ammon, and he did likewise for all of his foreign wives who burn incense and sacrifice to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart has turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father, David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Today I want to talk about a change of heart. A change of heart. Touch somebody and tell them, neighbor, don't let your heart change toward God. Amen. You may be seated. A change of heart. There was a television show in the late 90s called A Change of Heart. The premise of the show was that a couple would come on television after they'd had some rough and rocky moments in their relationship and they would get the opportunity to date someone else. Many people's hearts were broken because after their loved one went on that date with someone else, they would come back concluding that they no longer wanted to be in that relationship, but they had found someone new. This is literally what happens in the life of Solomon. Solomon early on has a love affair with God. He's committed to him and devoted to him. Solomon is the son of King David, the greatest and most righteous king of all of Israel. The scripture says that when Solomon comes to power, he's in this position, but he's too young to really know how to manage what God had given to him. Solomon has blind spots. He's got some weaknesses. He's got some insecurities and some immaturity. He also has some inexperience. So he prays and he asks God for the wisdom to be able to reign over the kingdom of Israel and to discern between right and wrong. Solomon says, God, I'm in this position and I believe you put me in this position because you want me to do well. But God, I understand there's some weaknesses that I have. There's some blind spots. So God, what I want you to give me is wisdom. Solomon prays because he's in love with God. He's devoted to God so much so that the first seven years of his kingdom he spends building a temple to God. Solomon says, I'm not going to worry about building myself a mansion or a house. I'm going to give my attention to fully following after God, and he builds and erects the temple. There in the temple, he will offer up thousands of sacrifices on the altar. As he offers those sacrifices, it shows his love and his fidelity and his commitment to God. So powerful was the spirit of God that the priests could not even worship and the people could not even have service because God showed up in that place. 
Solomon, first and foremost, follows after God. He loves him. He wants to know what his statutes are. He wants to know what's pleasing to him. And can I tell you, that's what God wants us to get first. God wants us to love him first. God doesn't want us to be so consumed with the stuff we want to go after. God doesn't want us to be consumed with climbing the corporate ladder. God doesn't want us to be consumed with all of the different things that come to our mind. God says, I want to be numero uno in your life. I want you to love me and be committed to me because I will do some stuff in your life you could not do on your own. And Solomon loves the Lord. He follows Follows his word to the T. See, this is what God wants us to understand. God says that when you love me and follow me, I will open up some doors and do some stuff in your life you could not have done on your own. I just want you to love me first because scripture says we ought to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. God, what's pleasing to you? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to order my affairs? Because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Have you ever been in love with somebody? Men in particular, y'all can identify that when you're in love with somebody or you desire someone, you put your best foot forward because you're trying to win their heart. So there's certain stuff you don't do in front of them. You open up the door for them when it's time for them to get in the car. You open up the door for them when it's time to go to the restaurant. You slide the chair back. You on your best behavior. You putting your best manners forward. Why? Because you're trying to get their heart. God said, that's what I want you to do for me. I want you to open up the door of your heart for me to come in. I want you to walk in a way that's pleasing to me. I want you to pray prayers like this. Lord, let the words of my heart and my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. God God, whatever displeases you, I don't want to do it. Whatever gets in the way of you, I don't want to be involved in it. Because, God, I want to show you I'm after your heart. And God says, as you love me, I'll teach you how to love other people. I'll teach you who I am. In fact, somebody who's single right now, God said, I'm not letting you have nobody right now because I want you to myself. I'm a jealous God. I don't want your job getting in the way of you. I don't want a man getting in the way of me and you. Even when you get married, I still want to get away in secret rendezvous with you. I want you to pray and seek after me. I want you to spend time with me because I want first in your life just so that I know I'm in the right house. Is there anybody up in this place who can say my number one aim is to please God in this season of my life? Delight yourself in the Lord. Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Not only is he passionate, but he's prosperous. Because when he follows after God, get this, God says, because you did not ask for the death of your enemies, because you didn't ask for wealth and riches, because you only ask for wisdom, I'm not only going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you wealth. Solomon has so much wisdom after he prays this prayer. God transfers wisdom to his mind. Solomon is so wise that 1 Kings chapter 4 says his wisdom superseded the wisdom of the sages. He's wise beyond his years and he's wise beyond his peers. Solomon is a philosopher, a botanist, and an international businessman. He spoke 3,000 different parables. He writes the book of Proverbs. He is someone who writes 1,000 songs, like the Song of Solomon. Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes. He hosts international summits where world leaders from around the world will come and sit at his feet to gather and glean information. Solomon is such an astute businessman that he puts a stranglehold on the trade caravans between Arabia and Mesopotamia. Solomon sends out these ships that go out every three years, bringing back gold and exotic creatures and silver. Solomon imports horses from Arabia. He exports them to neighboring nation. He advances the military machinery of Israel. He is an example of God-given wisdom and God-given wealth, that God God does not have a problem in blessing his people. God 
God just wants you to keep him first. God says, when I know you are after my heart, you can have everything in my hand. But I don't want you after my hand. I want you after my heart. When I know I got your heart, I can bless you on your job. I can bless you in your business. I can bless you in your career. I can open up doors in your life. I can do stuff for you you could not have done on your own. I just want to know, do I have your heart? I don't want you in a manipulative relationship with me where you only serve to get what I got. I want to know, do you love me for me? I want to know there's some people in here who can give God a praise that if he never gives you another thing, if he never opens up another door, he's already blessed you. He's already favored you. He's already done enough. God, I'm just going to bless you for who you are, not for what I can get from you, but just the essence of your being. Somebody in here ought to give him glory and you ought to give him praise. I want to give this to you. He prospers because he was passionate about God. I want to give this to you, young people. Please hear me. My daughter's going off to college. We got other young people who are in here, even young adults. Scripture says this, serve God in your youth. Don't wait till you made some bad mistakes and you say, I'm going to do all of this. Because some of us understand that when you make a pattern of living with certain habits, it builds for the rest of your life. God says, there's some stuff I want to do with you while you're young. I want to impart some wisdom to you. I want to give this to you. When you go to college, you pray and ask God what your major should be. Ask God what your electives should be. Ask God what study groups you should get in. Ask God what sorority or fraternity. God, I want you to order my steps. I want to keep you first in my life. You are before my schooling. You are before my education. You are before my job. Because I believe, God, you can get me to where I'm trying to go. And this is where Solomon was, but it changed. He loves God, follows God, built this temple, but it changed. How did it change? One deal after another, one trade after another. We see his fidelity, but then look at his foolishness. Because the Bible says Solomon loved many foreign women. Solomon marries the daughter of Pharaoh. Now remember God had forbid the children of Israel from intermarrying with neighboring nations, not because of race, but because of religion. God said, they into some freaky, crazy, nasty stuff I don't want y'all involved in. They're into idolatry and immorality. And, and here's what you got to understand, that you won't change them, but they can change you because evil communication corrupt good manner. So I don't want you engaged with them. It was not based upon race. It was based upon religion. There are multiple interracial relationships in scripture. Moses is married to a woman by the name of Zipporah. It is Ruth the Moabitess who marries a man by the name of Boaz. It is also Rahab the harlot who marries a man by the name of Sa God has never had an issue with interracial relationships based on race. It's only in this context based upon religion because God said I'm doing something with Israel and if I'm going to introduce myself to the world, I want there to be some standards of, of morality and purity and holiness. So I don't want y'all mixed up with all what they got going on because I made you holy unto me. But Solomon, as he trades, he begins to make small compromises because as he makes these deals with these kings, don't miss this, as he comes into these agreements and builds these alliances, what they would do in the ancient world is because women weren't seen as persons they were seen as property he would come into a trade agreement with a king and the king would give him his daughter the daughter would seal the deal because it's hard for me to go to war with you and you married to my daughter and got my grandchildren so there were treaties that were formed and he forges one treaty after another he does one deal after another and he adds multiple women to his harem don't miss this 
as he adds these women to his harem, gradually his convictions about God begin to change because when you are connected with somebody who does not commit themselves to God, the chances of them changing you are greater than you changing them. This is why the scripture says, be not unequally yoked with the unbeliever because if you are a Christian and you're connected with somebody who's not a Christian, it's going to be hard for you to worship and serve God. Okay, I know we city people. Here's what farmers would do. A yoke is what they would put on the neck of a beast of burden. So when the scripture says, be not unequally yoked with a non-believer, here's what that means. What the farmer would do is they would take two beasts of burden. They would take an ox and connect it with another ox. And then they would take the yoke and put it on their neck. They would do that because they were the same shape, they were the same size, and the same make. Watch this. So in order for them to furrow a straight line when they plowed, they would take two of the same beasts of burden because they had the same temperament and they went well together so the farmer could plow, sow his seed, and get the produce. But if the farmer took an ox and connected him with a jackass, it would be hard for them to plow a straight line. He would not be productive because the ox would be wanting to go one way and the donkey would go another way. See, it's hard for you to stay straight and follow God and you connect it with a jackass. It's going to be hard for you to follow God and you're connected with somebody who don't believe in him. You need somebody who believes in praying like you do, worshiping like you do, giving like you do, serving like you do. Is there a witness in this house that knows when you touch and agree with the right person you can do some great stuff it's in the bible and the text says that he gradually somebody say gradually begins to compromise and change God says the reason I don't want you hitched or hooked up or attached to somebody who doesn't believe in me is because they'll pull you in the wrong way. Even if they are a Christian, you need to make sure it's a good fit. I'm going to say it again. You got to mature and get to the point where you can size somebody up and say, they good for somebody, they just may not be good for me. What you say no to is what God may say yes to later on. Sometime you are a Christian and a believer. I want you to get this. Just because they're a Christian don't mean they're a mature Christian. You need to ask the Christian, what kind of Christian are you? I'm not saying that they're not saved. I'm not questioning their salvation. I'm just saying you got to be careful if you're a mature Christian that you don't rob the spiritual cradle because you dating a babe and you're a full-grown, mature believer. It's hard for them to be disciplined, so there's a struggle back and forth. You need to be connected with somebody who's in the spirit with you that you can flow with, that when you pray together, one can chase a thousand two can put ten thousand to flight and Solomon makes the mistake of marrying multiple women I hear Mike on here it is he says I can marry these women and as he introduces himself to them watch this he asks himself the question wait a minute maybe those laws that Moses put into place are not as relevant now because we're in a different age Maybe that was for them, but it's not for, I don't see that much wrong with them. I mean, they look strange, look different. I ain't grow up like that, but I see, I don't see, he starts justifying some of what they're doing to be in a relationship with them. So gradually, it starts changing him. Watch this. Solomon says, you know what? I believe, in fact, they may worship these idols and all that, don't believe in my God. Here's what it is. I know what it is. The queen of Sheba came, and when she came and saw our temple, she was never the same. She went back, and she was worshiping God. She believed it. Here's what I believe. I believe if I take them to my church, if I expose them to the true and living God, if they hear my choir and the way they worship, I believe I could change them. 
this is the mistake a whole lot of people make. And you got to be careful because some people can fool you temporarily. Oh, he'll get a cross. Ain't no problem with him getting the Bible. Ain't no problem with him visiting you at church and playing the part for a moment. Then when you get in a relationship with them, you end up like Deborah Cox talking about how did I get here? I wasn't even supposed to be here. I thought he was saying, I ain't know he was crazy for real, for real, but you should have saw the sign. And Solomon marries, don't miss this, many foreign wives. I want you to write this down, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. This is a proverb from Solomon, and he speaks to his son later on. Get this, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Whoever has your heart has influence over you. Whoever has your ear has some form of influence and control over you. This is why, I'm going to give you this for free. This is why you can't let everybody into your personal space. This is why you can't have conversations that long with everybody because you'll start drawing from their well and they got some poison in their well and they dumping some negativity in your life. I'm sorry. Some people, you need to radar them real quick and say, you ain't good for me right now. You are not about to mess up my day with your sorry, sour, messed up disposition. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad about it. The sun is shining. The snow ain't falling. I walked in here healthy and strong. Matter of fact, somebody in here ought to just give God some praise because the person on your row is acting dead, sullen, quiet. Somebody in here makes some noise in this place. Guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. When he says that, he's not just talking about guard your emotions, your anger and frustration. Yeah, you should learn how to do that. You got to learn how to hide your facial expressions. Can I preach in this house on the day? You got to learn to be wise with your word, wise with the way you respond. Don't show your anger. Don't show, come on, because the Bible says a fool shows his anger at once, but a wise man hides an offense. It's not just talking about that. It's also talking about be careful who you become intimate with. And intimacy doesn't always have to do with sex. Intimacy has to deal with how close you get to certain people. Because there's some people who you are intimate with in a moment, and you mistake intimacy for loyalty. Intimacy and loyalty are different. Because some people can sleep with you, sit down and have a meal with you, enjoy and celebrate you, and still stab you in your back. Okay, y'all need a witness for this. Come here, Samson. Samson was so in love with Delilah that he laid his head in the lap of Delilah because Delilah had his heart. Delilah still set him up for the kill because he made the mistake of thinking because we intimate, you're going to be loyal. He gave his heart to the wrong person. And when you give your heart to the wrong person, they have the power to lead you astray. This is why sometimes when you see somebody with somebody and they no good, and then you talk to somebody else and say, won't somebody tell them, girl, you can't tell him nothing, her nothing. Her nose is wide open. You can't tell him nothing. They got them hook, line, and sinker because they've given their heart to the wrong person. Guard your heart. For out of it flows. The issues of life. This is a true story. I enrolled in barber school when I was 15 years old. 15 years old, youngest barber in the state of Indiana. And I enrolled in the Kenny's Barber Academy. And there was a guy in there we all looked up to. This guy was about 19, 20 years old. He was the quintessential barber. I mean, he had, he had not only the skills, he had the look, the professionalism. He was always clean cut. He was like um, Carlton off of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He was a clean cut, proper kind of guy, went to church, didn't do any wrong. We would take broke breaks and go chief. Come on, somebody. He never did that. I'm sorry. Can I be real for a moment? He never did that. He was the quintessential barber. But he ended up getting with the wrong woman. And she introduced him to Primo's. Primo's is what we used to call weed cigarettes with crack and cocaine sprinkled on it. 
He had never done drugs in his life, but he gave his heart to this girl. She introduced him to this drug. We watched his life begin to plummet and fall. He died last year of a heart attack, but the heart issue was long before last year. It was when he gave his heart to the wrong woman. And the Bible says Solomon gave his heart, don't miss this, to multiple women, and he turned his heart away from God. I want you to get this. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. And if you are not careful, you will come into connection with somebody and you know there's some stuff that's not right about them, but now you've given your heart to them. So you start justifying what they do, explaining it away. Then after a while, you become a part of what they're doing. And now you are doing the same things you said you'd never do. How did a man who built the temple. Years the Jewish people was waiting for the temple to be built. In fact, for centuries they were walking around with the tabernacle. Now the temple is built. He's got the privilege and honor of building. How did he drift away from God? Here it is, point number one, we see his fidelity. Point number two, we see his foolishness, but then we see his fall. You know what got him to this place? Solomon is offering sacrifices to false idol gods because of all of the women he had given himself to. Don't miss this. He's got 1,000 women. 1,000. Y'all, y'all missed that. One, 700 wives. 300 concubines. He's the Hebrew Hugh Hefner. He's got Playboy mansions before there were Playboy mansions. Solomon's got exotic women from all over the world. Now, y'all done got quiet on me because women are like, where you going with this, pastor? Then the men are like, say some more. What's happening here? Here it is. 700 wives, 300 concubines, but it pulled him away from God because to have relationships with them it messed with his relationship with God. I want to give y'all this. Ain't nobody worth my relationship with God. Ain't no, ain't no man worth it. Ain't no woman worth it. Ain't no job worth it. Ain't no deal on the table. Ain't no opportunity. Ain't no amount of money you can offer me. What will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? You ain't going to get in between me and God. I don't care how fine you are. I don't care how good you look, how good you smell. I know what God, oh God, if I got a witness up in this place now this is where I want to help you because the Bible says 700 wives, 300 concubines and Solomon is all mixed up okay he's mixed up how's he end up mixed up because here it is, paint this the Bible says he builds temples across from Jerusalem you know, the scripture doesn't always tell you specifically what it wants you to study. It'll just put it in the text. You got to dig. It says, Chemosh, Molik, the gods of Moab. In order to worship these gods, it would involve child sacrifices. In fact, Molik was a god that they had built an idol so large to that you had to walk upstairs to perform your sacrifice. The God that they built had in his lap a fire that would burn. And then they would take their children, walk up the stairs, and drop them in the fire. It was an abomination to God. Then the God of Asherah, it was sexual orgies they would perform in order to conjure up what they thought was the spirit of that God. So Solomon has all of these mixed up views and beliefs. He's worshiping God on one hand, but he's got mixed worship because as the smoke from Yahweh's house is ascending to heaven, there's also the smoke from Molik ascending at the same time. Not only is he confused, but he leads the nation in idolatry because the people under you are not going to do what you say. They're going to do what you do. That's why, parents, you got to be careful who you got sneaking in the front door and the back door and you shouting on Sunday. Then you got Billy tipping through the window on Wednesday and your child is scratching their head saying, wait a minute, I heard the same words you heard. How we got all this mixed up stuff going on in here? 
and he's mixed up. He's the first ancient New Ager. You know what he believes? Now Solomon had convictions about God. Now he believes all roads lead to heaven. Why? Because his heart has been given to the wrong person. How does he end up in idolatry and immorality and mixed up? He ends up in idolatry and immorality because of his promiscuity. Okay. As he sleeps with all of these women and he's intimate with all of these different women, he gives a part of himself to them and he gets a part of them. Because you don't just sleep with a person. You sleep with their history. This is why you can't sleep with everybody. Because some people got mental illness in their history. Some people got depression in their history. Some people got suicidal thoughts in their history. Some people got demon possession in their history. And you're wondering why you mixed up, depressed, down and out, up one day, down the rest. It could be you've been connected with the wrong people. Now I'm going to help you. God says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You need to bring that thing to the altar and say, God, take the taste out my mouth. Change my heart from the inside out. Change my taste buds and my desires. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. I want you to get this. There's always strings attached. I wish I could preach it all the way. Can I preach 1130 up in here? I'm going to dig here. Because um, the devil deceived us into thinking we can sin safely. All you got to do is wrap it up. Did it ever occur to you that sex wasn't even supposed to be dangerous? But we think we can sin safely. Can a man take fire in his bosom and not be burned? There's some stuff a condom can't keep you from catching. Y'all ain't helping me up in this place. I wish I had a witness up in this place that had matured to the point. You ain't been no saint. You ain't perfect, but you matured. Matter of fact, it don't mean there's not still some stuff you struggle with. You've just matured and got wisdom to the point that it ain't even worth all that. All the stuff that's going to cost me, all the stuff that's going to mess up in my life, how that's going to follow me, I'm sorry, I'll pass. Have I got some mature people? I know you're still growing. You're still trying to get more in tune with God, but can I have some people up in here who can say, honey, it ain't always been my prayer life. It's been wisdom enough after being burnt. I I've learned, and if you get burned long enough, you learn what you need to know. Some folk been burnt literally and figuratively. Y'all ain't gonna help me preach. I'm about to close it. I wish I could hang out there a little bit longer. Can I hang out there just a little bit longer? Don't be deceived by what's on the surface. He brings them in. Can I, can I tell y'all what happened? How is, it, how is it Solomon? You built temples to him, though. I mean, I mean, I could see you made some compromises. I, I get it. You was weak. You did all that. How in the world did you build God's temple? Then you built temples for them around God's. Because he's got 700 wives. Y'all missed it. One woman speaks three times as many words as a man. He got 700 of them. Can I use my sanctified imagination? I believe they came in at different times. Bay, you know, I'm tired always traveling to Moab so far. What? What do you think about building us? It don't have to be big. We're just going to build a small one. I want, just think about it. Then another one came in. You know, if you're going to build her one, now you know we ain't from where she's from. We want to build one to our God too. Now we know, you believe what you want to believe, you ain't got to believe what we got to believe. Just come every now and then. Just put an incense on there. Just watch us while we're It would mean so much to me if you came. Solomon gradually found himself burning incense at the altars of their gods to the neglect of his God. And the Bible says, God said, 
I'm displeased with this. I'm so displeased about it that I'm going to take some of what I gave you. But God's grace is so good. God said, I'm not going to do it in your lifetime. I'm going to do it in the next generation. I, I could hang out there for a moment. How there are some people right now who are walking into some mistakes somebody else made. And some stuff that people are dealing with right now is because of the poor decisions their father or their mother made in their life. And I've got a prayer for you right now that I believe God still wishes the best for you. And you can break that curse and that pattern. But you got to decide to do differently because God is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of principle. And if you say maybe there's some stuff I learned, some stuff I was taught that wasn't right. I'm willing to give that up to go after God. Solomon is empty, but he's also got enemies. I'm going to throw this out for free because God said, I'm going to raise up the people I've been holding back. God said, the reason you have peace and prosperity it's not because there wasn't some enemies trying to get at you. It's just because when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies will be at peace with him. And one of the signs of God's goodness and favor on you is that the psalmist said, here's how I know the Lord favored me because my enemies didn't get to triumph over me. I'm sorry, I'm going to have church in this moment for myself. Have I got two or three people who could say, it ain't that some dogs ain't been barking. They just ain't been able to bite because God's favor has been over my life. It ain't that there ain't been some people been fiending for me to fall. It just ain't happened yet because I've been walking close with And as long as you walk close to him, God will keep some stuff off of you. Y'all know sinning is too dangerous. I don't want to get outside the force field. And the Bible says, I'm about to close. Solomon has enemies. Solomon is empty. Please do me a favor, read Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is the memoirs of Solomon when he strayed from God. Solomon said, I did it all. I built buildings. I've been a part of building projects and construction. He said, I did it all. I did international business and trade. I did it all. I've traveled the world. I've drank the best alcohol. I've used the best drugs. He said, I did it all. Had multiple women. Then watch what he says. But it left me empty because the fulfillment of man ultimately comes from God. And the reason he said he was empty because he was full of all that other stuff. But then he got empty of God. But Solomon came back to himself and he comes back to God at the end of Ecclesiastes and said, vanity of vanities, everything that I wanted to do and try, I did it. But I found there was no fulfillment in it in the end. He said, I tried travel and it only took me so far. He said, I tried indulging in physical pleasures, but it only fulfilled me for so long. He said, I engaged in business and it failed my self-esteem and my ambition, but it faded away. But he said, there was a time I was connected with God and I had joy and I had power and I had peace and I had confidence. For this. He said, I want that back again. And he goes back to God. And he writes to his own son. Please read Proverbs. That's his letter to his son. He says, son, guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. Then he gives him another piece of advice for his heart. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will Direct your path. The good news about his story is that he strayed, but God brought him back to him. The good news is that even when he went away from God and he got outside of the will of God, God's grace and mercy got him and brought him back home. Because when God has put something on the inside of you, you might stray and go away. You may make some bad decisions, but when God puts something on the inside of you, it ain't long before you come back home. Have I got a witness up in this house?
Hey, thanks for tuning in to this video broadcast on the day. I trust that it really bless and transform your life. I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you can hear more messages like these. I want to also encourage you to invite all your family and friends to sit down and enjoy these messages with you so that they can be blessed as well. You can also stream us every single Sunday here at New Direction Church. Well, that's my time. I look forward to seeing you all soon. God bless you. Take care. Come on, give God some glory in this house. Oh, that's a patty cake praise. I said, give God some glory. Give God some praise. Come on, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Touch somebody who's breathing and tell him he's talking about you. He's talking about you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, we got a reason to worship. 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 I'm going to stir it up. We got a reason to worship. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, even when I don't feel like it, my soul, I said, my soul, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Come on, put your greatest praise on it right there. If you know it's working together for your good, come on, come on. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I, I was glad. I was excited. I, would, I wasn't beat down. I wasn't weary. I wasn't tired. I wasn't lackadaisical. I was glad. Is there anybody in here glad on today? Hallelujah. We ought to praise God with some excitement and enthusiasm and some expectation. How many of y'all are expecting God to do some stuff? I'm, I'm talking about the folk who's still expecting God to perform some miracles, signs, and wonders. This is a year of great expectations. I'm, I'm expecting God to bless everything I put my hand on. I'm, I'm expecting God to go ahead of me before I get there. I'm, I'm expecting God to cover my backside, my sides. Come on, somebody give God some glory in here if you've got some expectation. I would have fainted unless I believe that I see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Do me a favor and show some love for this awesome and amazing, awe-inspiring music department on today. I got a lot of ground to cover on today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share a whole lot with y'all. I got some preaching to do today. Um, to all of our guests who are here, we're grateful to have you in the house with us. Can we give it up for all of our guests? Thank you all for being with us in worship. We have been made the better because of your very presence. This is the final message uh, in our series, Love and Verses. Uh, Love and Verses. Have y'all been blessed by this series? Yeah. Now, now it's not only the last day of this message. This, this is what we would call the A-side, uh, or the B-side, rather. But in the book, um, nothing I've shared throughout February is going to be in the book. So the book is completely different. I had people send me messages from all over the country and uh, telling me how this was going to be a blessing to them in their marriage at the right time in a relationship. And I don't just want you to get a book today, pre-order it, but I want you to pre-order it for somebody else because I believe it is going to be a blessing to so many people's lives that we want to do that. Amen? Amen. Let's get to the word. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. And I want the freedom and the flexibility and the time to teach and preach on the day. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 through 13 of 1 Kings chapter 11. When you have arrived, please say amen. Now, I'm going to read from the New King James Version. And here's what I want you to do. I don't just want you to read and hear this on today. I, please do me a favor and read in your private time was shared, and then I want you to also reference other passages of scriptures I'm going to reference because it's all going to make sense when you see it all together. Amen? 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning at the first verse, but before we arrive to that passage of scripture and read this powerful, poignant passage of scripture, I want you to join me in a word of prayer. Before we do, I want to highlight, we had a prayer marathon on yesterday. How many of y'all were blessed by that? We had a prayer marathon where we prayed from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and we've been praying over the city. We've been praying over 
just so many different things. Mayor Hogsett was at our 10 o'clock service, and he was sharing about his summer jobs program. And we stand with and behind our mayor. The Bible says, pray for those who are in authority, that you might lead a quiet and peaceable life. And uh, I'm expecting God to do some phenomenal stuff through our church to not only save people spiritually, but to make a difference in our community, in our city. Amen. And so we pray for that, and we're excited about that. First Kings chapter 11. Let's pray. God, we are grateful and thankful for these precious moments you've allowed us to have. God, you've blessed us to be in our right minds, to be cognizant of what's happening around us, to be here present in this space and time and history. We thank you, God, because you've allowed us to be here. God, there's some other places we could have been, but you've blessed us to be in this house. So God, since we've come into your house, we ask you would speak to our hearts and to our minds and change us and transform us. Take your word, which has already been prepared in private, impress it upon the hearts and minds of the hearers, that we might not just be hearers, but doers of your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. First Kings chapter 11. I want you to really read this carefully. Here's what it says. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn your hearts after other gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. That's sad, chicks. <laughs> and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord as was the heart of his father, David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as his father David did. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon, and he did likewise for all of his foreign wives who burn incense and sacrifice to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart has turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father, David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Today, I want to talk about a change of heart. A change of heart. Touch somebody and tell them, neighbor, don't let your heart change. Toward God. Amen. You may be seated. A change of heart. There was a television show in the late 90s called A Change of Heart. The premise of the show was that a couple would come on television after they'd had some rough and rocky moments in their relationship and they would get the opportunity to date someone else. Many people's hearts were broken because after their loved one went on that date with someone else, they would come back concluding that they no longer wanted to be in that relationship, but they had found someone new. This is literally what happens in the life of Solomon. Solomon early on has a love affair with God. He's committed to him and devoted to him. Solomon is the son of King David, the greatest and most righteous king of all of Israel. The scripture says that when Solomon comes to power, He's in this position, but he's too young to really know how to manage what God had given to him. Solomon has blind spots. He's got some weaknesses. He's got some insecurities and some immaturity. He also has some inexperience. 
So he prays and he asks God for the wisdom to be able to reign over the kingdom of Israel and to discern between right and wrong. Solomon says, God, I'm in this position, and I believe you put me in this position because you want me to do well. But, God, I understand there's some weaknesses that I have. There's some blind spots. So, God, what I want you to give me is wisdom. Solomon prays because he's in love with God. He's devoted to God so much so that the first seven years of his kingdom he spends building a temple to God. Solomon says, I'm not going to worry about building myself a mansion or a house. I'm going to give my attention to fully following after God, and he builds and erects the temple. There in the temple, he will offer up thousands of sacrifices on the altar. As he offers those sacrifices, it shows his love and his fidelity and his commitment to God. So powerful was the spirit of God that the priests could not even worship and the people could not even have service because God showed up in that place. Solomon, first and foremost, follows after God. He loves him. He wants to know what his statutes are. He wants to know what's pleasing to him. And can I tell you, that's what God wants us to get first. God wants us to love him first. God doesn't want us to be so consumed with the stuff we want to go after. God doesn't want us to be consumed with climbing the corporate ladder. God doesn't want us to be consumed with all of the different things that come to our mind. God says, I want to be numero uno in your life. I want you to love me and be committed to me because I will do some stuff in your life you could not do on your own. And Solomon loves the Lord. He follows Follows his word to the T. See, this is what God wants us to understand. God says that when you love me and follow me, I will open up some doors and do some stuff in your life you could not have done on your own. I just want you to love me first because scripture says we ought to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. God, what's pleasing to you? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to order my affairs? Because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Have you ever been in love with somebody? Men in particular, y'all can identify that when you're in love with somebody or you desire someone, you put your best foot forward because you're trying to win their heart. So there's certain stuff you don't do in front of them. You open up the door for them when it's time for them to get in the car. You open up the door for them when it's time to go to the restaurant. You 